Hi, everyone. My name is Sahar Driver. I'm co-founder and co-executive director of Color Congress alongside uh, Sonia Childress. And uh, my, hello. Oh my gosh, you guys look warm, but beautiful, glowing, glistening. My name is Sonia. And I am the co-director uh, as well um, with Sahar Driver. I'm a black woman wearing glasses, locks, and a uh, black jumpsuit. And I should say that I'm a Iranian-American woman, Middle Eastern features, long, dark hair, and wearing a black skirt and a tan top. So what an honor it is for us to be hosted um, by uh, one of our favorite member organizations and festivals, one of the premier, most beautiful, family-friendly, gorgeous, beautifully curated, and thoughtfully arranged festival, Black Star Film Festival. Let's give the festival workers all of their love. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, so a, a little bit about, uh, to, to start us off, I'm gonna share a little bit about the Color Congress for those of you who are not as familiar. Um, we launched Color Congress in 2022, virtually, as a container for connection, as an ecosystem builder to serve people of color led and serving documentary organizations across the United States and the US islands. In the two and a half years that we've been in operation, we now currently serve 108 organizations across this country and uh, the island nations of Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Northern Mariana Islands and Guam. Woo -hoo! And these organizations are unique, uh, not only because they're you know, built by people of color, but they were built by folks who really believe in the authorship of filmmakers of color and who are highly connected to and accountable to the communities of color that they serve. And bringing the work of filmmakers of color to communities of color is a hallmark of the organizations that are in our membership. But sadly and unsurprisingly, as we launched the organization, began talking about our work with industry folks and funders, we found that many of them, even the majority of them, uh, were flying under the radar of the view of philanthropy and of the documentary industry. So last, uh, this year, we released a report called The People of Color Documentary Ecosystem Engines for a New American Narrative as a way to make visible the contributions of these organizations, to share, talk about who they serve, how they serve them, what is their relationship to the documentary form, and what is their relationship to the documentary industry. And here's a little bit about what we shared in that report. About one third of the member organizations are artist support organizations that offer fellowships, training programs. One third focus on disseminating work and are audience facing, like Black Star and other film festivals. Another third are collectives and networks funders, and initiatives aiming to transform the documentary industry. Most of our members were launched in the 2010s, but the OG of our membership is Third World Newsreel, which was launched over 50 years ago. And our newest organization, our baby organization, is just less than a year old, and it was the one that's based in the Mariana Islands. Again, they're based all across the country. We have membership everywhere except for Alaska. We're, we're looking for a program in Alaska, if you know of one. What we also found is that the majority of our members are still led by their founders, and that 94% of these founders self-identify first as filmmakers. 24% of our members operate, this is the money piece, with an annual budget that is less than $50,000. Take that in. Seventeen percent of our members report no full-time or part-time staff. Many organizations that we serve are fiscally sponsored, and among those, 75 percent have no full-time paid staff. So what we find is that our membership is led by folks who self-identify largely as filmmakers, largely as women and non-binary folks, and they built organizations that would champion their work and the work of people like them. 
And they're doing this work knowing that they are likely going to have to put their own filmmaking to the side and get unpaid and be unpaid to do this field building work. And yet, despite the fact that they are not getting served by philanthropy and not getting recognized often by the industry, last year alone, our members served over 15,000 documentary filmmakers, over 10,000 documentary film professionals, and over 20 million audience members were reached by their programming or services. And that is largely due to the NMCA, which is a National Multicultural Alliance, and POV, our POC-led public media organizations. Big up to them. So we see these, uh, these organizations that we serve are not the DEI section of the film industry. These organizations are the places where filmmakers of color are seen, are valued, are centered, where their artistry and authorship is the reason, is in their, built into their DNA. These organizations understand that people of color are not just authors of our own history and stories, but we are also the audience for that work as well. And that, um, and that they create cultural and artistic homes where politically engaged documentary work, which is shaping narratives that, uh, that shape policies, that work is getting germinated and supported and funded and uplifted through this ecosystem of organizations. They are a lifeline, and I know that many of you can attest to that. So we wanted to just share a little bit about who these members are and why they're so vital to the field. We also wanted to gather you here today and, and have this conversation with you, the community of filmmakers that our ecosystem of uh, POC-led and serving organizations serve, um, so that you're aware of the very specific challenges that they face today uh, in this social and political context. Um, as Sonia mentioned, uh, historically this ecosystem has struggled with getting the resourcing that it deserves. It's constantly punching above its weight, um, doing really important and strong work. Um, it's also, as Sonia mentioned, uh, struggled with uh, gaining the visibility that it uh, deserves for the work that it does. Um, and Sonia and I uh, started trying to counteract that by uplifting and uh, putting a spotlight on those efforts, uh, really shining a light on how powerful and um, important that work is, and uh, realized suddenly that we were doing that in a context that could be endangering these organizations. Uh, some context for that. Um, there is currently increased scrutiny uh, for any organization uh, in this country that uh, is addressing race-specific challenges uh, and inequities through really effective uh, and uh, smart race-specific solutions uh, and interventions. Um, that's especially true for organizations that are funded by uh, government or philanthropy. Um, there's also a specter of legal challenges. Um, uh, some examples that I'll uh, name real quickly is uh, the Fearless Fund. Uh, it's a Atlanta-based organization that is built to serve um, black women entrepreneurs and uh, runs a grant program uh, for that particular community. Um, a lot of folks have been uh, tracking the Fearless Fund because the results of this particular case will signal uh, the extent to which race-conscious grant-making will be able to succeed or proceed in this country. Um, uh, the plaintiffs of this case are, were two unnamed white business owners who said that they were ready and able to apply for um, uh, the grant program, but were ineligible because of their race, essentially saying programs that were designed to address a particular inequity experienced by black women uh, business owners uh, was itself racist. That's the context for where we're at. Um, we thought, we hoped that the Fearless Fund attempted to um, uh, stay an injunction uh, so that they could proceed with their work while the case moved through the courts. And last month that failed, uh, which is all, all we, we can't read into it more than that, but it's not necessarily a good sign. Uh, also, I'm sure what's in the news right now is Project 2025. Uh, I'm sure lots of folks in this room have been following that. That is uh, essentially an anti-democratic, uh, very radical um, playbook 
that the Heritage Foundation has um, been advancing. Lots of folks from the previous administration are responsible for it. And uh, it aims to do a number of things, including rolling back uh, civil rights protections in this country. Uh, it's been targeting DEI programs targeting programs that are designed to uh, uh, ensure the rights of LGBT community, communities in health, education, and the workplace. Um, and uh, also, as Sonia mentioned, public media is an essential part of this ecosystem, and uh, it aims to dismantle public media. Um, in addition, uh, the organizations in our ecosystem are struggling with pressure to remain silent on Gaza. All of this is having a chilling effect on philanthropy, on philanthropic investment. It's also threatening philanthropic uh, disinvestment as uh, funders who are attempting to protect themselves are now reviewing uh, funding portfolios and uh, funding focuses. And uh, grant their grantees or prospective grantees and other nonprofit organizations are also reviewing, uh, feeling the pressure to review their own language and neutralize it. So that's the context for the conversation we want to have today. And um, we wanted to introduce you to a few panelists that exemplify the powerful work that this ecosystem does uh, for, to support really courageous and bold uh, film, filmmaking that is coming out of um, the filmmaking community. Uh, and that are also uh, shepherding an organization, supporting an organization that they're aiming to protect from these political and economic threats. Uh, we also are going to speak with a producer, an attorney, and an advocate um, who has been tracking these ca cases very closely and uh, get some of um, her expertise. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel. Uh, Nadine Patterson from SIFT Media 215 is the co-founder uh, and for five years has been raising funds and advocating for black and Latinx women here in Philadelphia. Uh, Nadine is most comfortable in uncomfortable conversations about money, equity, and access uh, to organizations and foundations here in the Philly area uh, and plants seeds of opportunity for the next generation. Malacheli Mejia Ravel is uh, the director of the Philadelphia Latino Arts and Film Festival. Uh, she's a Puerto Rican born, Philadelphia based connector, cultural organizer, producer, arts and cultural curator, and programmer. Uh, next to Malacheli is Francis Culado, who is the executive director of visual communications which is an LA-based organization dedicated to honest portrayals of Asian Pacific American uh, communities and heritage through media arts. And finally, Anurima Bargava, who is the founder and director of Anthem of Us, a strategic advisory and consultancy firm that centers dignity, justice, and belonging in workplaces, schools, and communities. Thank you all for being here today. So let's get into it. Um, uh, the champions of your filmmaking are on the stage, so many of them. So, so Nadine, let's start with you, dear. Hi. Um, so SIFT Media, as Sahar said, is a collective of black and Latine fi women filmmakers in Philly. Talk to us, paint a picture of the women filmmakers that you support, the kinds of films that they're making. Are they making overtly political films? Do they see their work in political terms? And if so, what are the barriers that they're facing to making that work today? Well, thank you so much for, for inviting me and all of us here in this wonderful panel. And thank you to Black Star. I, I think the work of Sisters in Film and Television is political because it's human work. It's very human. And it's hard for mainstream media to understand that black and brown people are not always in traumatic situations. They're not always involved in violence, in, um, in incarceration, in poverty. And even if they are, we are never portrayed as being the heroes in our own stories. We're never portrayed as being the people who can transform and change the situation that we're in. We're always needing a white savior. 
So in these narratives, again and again, there are black films, quote unquote, black films, written and directed and produced by white people. So our goal is to change that. Last night we had a powerful event where we showed eight wonderful films called Good Grief, all directed by women of color. All except for one had a DP that was woman, woman of color and edited by women of color. And when you see that on a stage, it's mind blowing because we were used to seeing white guys on, on a stage at a film festival. White guy number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Maybe a white woman or a gay person, but never all black women. And that was a first for many people to see and witness last night. And I wanna give a shout out to Ray Shaw who did a wonderful piece um, called In Memory uh, with Dominique who's a wonderful poet. I also wanna give a shout out to all of the found founding women of Sisters in Film and Television. Yolanda Johnson Young is also here in the audience and Leanne is our social media person. Um, but these human stories are just not seen. We had a project last year called the COVID-1619 project and we had a deal with a wonderful public TV station here in Philadelphia with a wonderful programmer, a woman of color. And when she left, that deal fell through. The new programmer had no interest in showing our COVID-1619 film. We had formatted it for public television. It ran, you know, 28 minutes, four stories, all under, you know, 10 minutes in length. And we could not get the time of day. We were told that, well, it's not topical anymore. It took us three years to make that film. Uh, we started out with a wonderful grant from Independence Public Media Foundation, thank you very much. But that was a $20,000 grant. We uh, pitched our idea to the Lenfest Foundation, yes, I will name names, and we applied for $100,000, did not get that grant. And if we had gotten that grant, we could have made that film within a year. But, but because we were operating on a shoestring at that time, it took us three years to finish the film. And by that time, HYY thought it wasn't relevant anymore. So having money to pay filmmakers and to complete a film in a timely fashion is essential for our work. Now with the Good Grief Project, one of my friends last night, I think it was Leanne, said, well, this is an evergreen project. We are always dealing with grief, right? So it will never run out of fashion. But the beauty of those films is that they're all visually stunning. I mean, visually stunning and different, powerful pieces. One piece deals with food insecurity. Another piece deals with a woman who lost her fiance. Uh, and, another, and, and actually two women lost their fiancés and, 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 and were recently married, right? Uh, people have dealt with grief of parents in these films. So it's just so wonderful to have a well-funded project funded by IPMF who gave operational support for the staff so I could work on the project, right, as executive producer, so that Nikki Harmon could work on the project as a producer. And so that, it's important to have that operational support from foundations. Then we sought additional money from the William Penn Foundation and got a $75,000 grant from them in November. And that enabled us to complete the film by uh, yesterday, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so the money aspect, I mean, film is the most expensive art form after architecture. And women of color, even after you make your first feature film, you may go 10, 12 years, 20 years before you make your second. So it's imperative that we not only make uh, impacts and inroads in the foundation world, but also in government, through the PBS system. Of course, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting should fund diverse organizations across the country at 100 times the level that they currently are funding them, right? I mean, black public media is so foundational. Many Philadelphians have benefited from their program support. I have benefited from their program support. My mother, Marlene Patterson, is one of the filmmakers, along with me, who we got a grant of 
27,000 in 1997 for a piece called Moving with, with the Dreaming about Aboriginal modern dance in Australia. So it's imperative that we women of color have access to funds, have access to distribution to tell these stories. And without that, we are, we are muted. So, so the funding landscape for uh, women of color filmmakers to tell stories about their intersectional identities from a place of honesty and truth um, continues to be a challenge and a barrier. Marangeli, you run the Philadelphia Latino Film Festival, yes. which creates space for Latine filmmakers to make work and, to, and for that work to be seen by Latine audiences and beyond. And so thinking about being an identity-based film festival in this moment when identity-based organizations might be feeling some early heat um, before uh, some legal restrictions may or may not come, what is it, how are you navigating this moment um, as a leader of one of these organizations and as a defender of the filmmakers who you serve? Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with you, and thank you, Nadine, and thank you to all the panelists and the filmmakers in the audience for all the work that they do. I think that for us, the priority number one is not to be bitter, but to keep an open heart and an open mind, uh, show people some grace and compassion, right? Understanding that they're difficult times, and stay open and nimble to adapt and to build the power and be centered and grounded on the power of community. So providing opportunities to build community in a way that we're building capacity so community can also have the tools to share their own stories. Um, and that for us has been a process, right? You talked about COVID and, and all the different things, right? So. The contextual intelligence, a lot of times we talk about emotional intelligence, but contextual intelligence is very critical when it comes to collaboration. Collaboration is the other part that is key to our work and access, right? So how do we position the work in a manner that is accessible, that people can see themselves, that there are no barriers to them engaging, so we went um, you know, from being fully in person to then everybody knows what happens in 2020 and we were one of the first ones that went fully virtual and we have kept that dance and still hybrid to be able to provide that access to folks. Also programming in public access places like Cherry Street Pier and going to different locations around the city. Our position is to embrace the work with a learning posture and understanding that each season brings different, um, you know, learnings and takeaways for us. We have, you hear me kind of laughing because people will be like, what? And I have gotten that what a couple of times, but we, in order to do that, we had to really look at what growth meant for us, understanding how the landscape kept on changing and keeps on changing every day. So it's growth really about scaling or about taking a deeper dive. And for us, it's been taking the deeper dive and really going to the essence of the work, right? So for us, I mentioned community building and how do we build community in a way that is very intentional and that leads to integration. Understanding that what we want, again, is capacity and offerings that community can see themselves and run with it, right? So we began as a three-day festival, then pursue four days with the virtual transition, became an eight-day festival, and now we operate for six weeks. So how are we doing that? People are like crazy. Now I'm going to give you the detail. Our, our, our opening day or our kickoff day for virtual programming, we kick off virtually, is the Sunday before Memorial Day. And then our closing day, is the Sunday after the 4th of July. <laughs> and how do we do that? Well, we do virtual programming from Sunday through Saturday, right? Um, and then we do in-person activations at different locations throughout the city 
Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. So it's not a thing of you come to us, we'll go to you. We'll meet you, you know, where you are because we want folks to see us not only as a presenter, but as a collaborator, right? Uh, that has been key. That has been key. Making a conscious effort to really build talent and, and grow talent and develop talent and support talent, not only here, but, you know, we expanded our programming timeline because of the demand with submissions. And we have, you know, I don't know, this year was like 30% were first, there were directorial debuts that come to us from 21 countries. So, right, creating space for that. Also, diversifying the voices, the table, right? Sometimes we can, you know, it's, it's not only about what we want, but also keeping that openness to what it's needed. And understanding that we have two key stakeholders, right? Our audiences and then the creatives. And then of course the triangle. We wanna be a community of care, so we also wanna take care of ourselves. But understanding and having that openness has led us to now engaging two new initiatives. One is a fellowship where we have brought three uh, creatives to incubate projects and then two cultural producers in residence. Why? I'm a, at the core, I'm an organizer, right? It's the social interaction, it's the dance, and filmmaking and storytelling is that connection between past and future. It's that bond, it's that thread. And it's lifting legacy, well, celebrating legacy and lifting emerging voices and creating spaces for them to tell us what they need and for us to be responsive, not reactive. Love that. Thank you. And, and Francis, you are the executive director of Visual Communications, which runs the annual LA Asian American Pacific Island Film Festival, one of the oldest uh, AAPI film festivals on the West Coast. And uh, even though your organization is rooted in the AAPI community, lately what you've been doing actually is a lot of bridge building between the Asian American and Pacific Island community uh, within the construct of your festival. And you also curated a series of short films with uh, non-Asian American uh, color congress member organizations. So, Right now, you're leaning into an intentional posture of cross-identity community building um, and bridge building. And I wonder if you can say something about why now and what that work has looked like for you. Um, again, thank you for having me here. I'm Francis Collado. He and his. I'm, I'm a brown Filipino man with salt and pepper hair with a light brown shirt. Um, just one thing I've, I've learned in this space is to always bring the people that you're bringing with. So today I bring my grandmother who would have been 90 today. And I honor you all for being here today and, and honor the people that you bring with. So it's just an honor to be here with you folks. Um, during Getting Real, one of the things that you said it resonated, Color Congress is a solidarity project, right? And, and I, I think one of the best things we can do solidarity projects is based on values and common values that we have. Um, Sometimes solidarity projects feels like a solitary project, I, I'm assuming, right? And even though there's 100 plus organizations, what it means, and, and that's why it's always been a joy to converge every, you know, when we have monthly meetups just with each other. Because I'm, I'm honored to be in a space with organizers, but you're all our crisis workers through media, right? And this is sort of the, the empowerment that, that's here, and a lot of the work that's, you know, we've been trying to do the last couple of years is how do we actually create these um, bridges with other communities that share those values and, and not just because we're the, from the same country, from the same region, right? And, and, you know, initially a couple of years ago was really us asking what does Asian Pacific mean? You know, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, all, all that's messing us around it. What does it mean to have Asian colon, um, settler colonialism? What does it mean when we're uplifting anti-Asian hate and our Pacific communities don't feel a part of that conversation. Um, and, and, you know, and, and a, even sort of a continued practice of indigeneity and, and Latin acknowledgement. Um, I would just say a lot of these have had pushbacks, 
because we're kind of trying to change a little bit. And as you know, film festivals, we only have limited slots and it's always about kind of the, 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 the affirmative action conversations, like how about me, how about ourselves, right? Um, something about collect uh, being collective and its community is it has to be about ourselves and what does that mean? Um, you know, uh, we did a only Pacific uh, uh, fellowship program. We had a pushback for that because how about Asian Americans? Um, and then you know, for so a lot of these um, things and things that we're having, we to be honest, we don't know what, actually what we're doing. <laughs> it, it just feels good to be in community with people that 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 shares it. And um, you know, before I talked about. Um, one of the, the shorts programs that our um, collaborator is Silbar Lhasa, um, who pushed together as our senior programmer. Um, this year, we, we programmed with, with, with Entre, we, we, we programmed with, with Scribe, uh, Educational Video Center. These are folks who do work based on community, community media participatory programs. And, and a lot of that work has been shifting towards that because uh, the filmmakers that we work with, we actually want to ask their spaces of affirmation. And a lot of the times, it, when you work with community participatory media folks, their spaces of affirmation is the community. It's hard to work sometimes with people when they're looking for spaces of affirmation in the white spaces, in Hollywood, right? And, and, and what does that mean? And, 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 Sort of, so that's always been the conversation, what's going around, and, and, and just trying to find people in the community to do that work with. Um, you know, um, so the Shorts program consisted of, of folks just being trained to have a camera and just to just understand storytelling doesn't have to be from film school, it can just come from us, our grandparents are, 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 are this way. And one of the things that Color Congress has put to the table is what is the role of film festivals in distribution? Are we just distributing so we can get mainstream um, play, or are we actually distributing the, these stories from the ground? And those are the things we wanted to lean into. Um, hopefully, we get funding towards it. We, we did it without funding, and one of the things we were, you know, wish we had more money was to actually bring the filmmakers out and everybody to fully support that and resource that. But a lot of this continued work is just being in solidarity with, with folks, and, and, and sometimes I share this. The work, sometimes you feel stuck. All the things that you mentioned earlier, it's there. And, and thinking about this new engine, you know, thinking about the, this, this method of a flywheel, what does it mean to keep something going that's light? But imagine this flywheel with 100 plus organizations, how heavy it is to push. But once that gets going, it just sort of has this momentum, right? So, um, you know, those are the things I wanted to share as, as part of a, a learning experience of being part of this group the last couple of years. And, and, and just, just learning from, from, from collaborators with you folks has, has been an honor that I have. Thank you. Big up to Frances, Marangeli, and Nadine for their heartfelt work. So we're gonna bring our fourth voice into the conversation. And Anarima is, actually has a film out now. Anarima is a filmmaker. You are a producer and a director. Uh, and you are um, deeply invested in the film wor world. Um, but the other hat you wear is as a civil rights litigator and, and as your, your legal hat has brought you into the center of national battles um, around race and equity. And uh, in particular, um, you were involved in the case around uh, the repeal of affirmative action on, in college admissions last year with the Supreme Court. So um, Ana Rima is the mole in the room sometimes, um, the, the, um, working on our behalf, um, who is uh, part of incredible conversations um, on, our, on the legal front in addition to the cultural front. And so I want you to, after you've heard uh, about from leaders of film organizations and what their challenges are in funding, in bridge building, take us a step back and paint a picture of the political environment we're all operating within and the larger political project that your eye is on that's coming from the far right. Thank you. Uh, so just to begin, Anarima Bhargava, 
a South Asian brown woman with long black hair who's wearing a multicolored type of dress. And, um, and I, pronouns she, her, and I, I wanna just uh, to honor, as Francis, thank you, uh, did um, someone who is part of our filmmaking community um, who is who is not with us? Just search. Who passed away a year ago yesterday, and um, and is very much the reason that that I'm in this room um, as as someone who was blessed to be part of the Doc Society family. And so um, so I, I want to start there. And and so so I want to paint this picture and also like and incorporate so much of what we've just heard, right? Which is um, we are in the midst of this massive concerted effort. It's led by what I call the four horsemen. Some of them are familiar to you. Ed Bloom, Chris Rufo, um, that crowd, right? They're, 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 they're the same couple of people who've been around for a long time in multiple different places, right? And, and it includes, obviously, those who are in, trying to be in political power again, right? So, um, and the effort is to erase race. It is to erase who we are. It is to limit who we are so that it's not about whether we're Indian or black, it's just that we can only be something, right? And, and to really limit what that is, right? And, and, and it's also, importantly, to divide and conquer. They're trying to bury us, and when we try to come up, they're trying to pit us against each other, right? And, um, and we're seeing that not only among communities of color, we're seeing it obviously with Jewish communities and many other communities around the country right now. Um, and, and it's also an effort to control and to colonize us in terms of how we tell our stories and recognize our humanity. And so um, what are the ways in which they're doing that? They're doing that through law. They're doing that through language. But why are they doing it through law? It's partly because the law can't account for nuance and complexity and realness and authenticity and who we are. It's incapable of doing that, right? So it's a real, it's, it's a blunt instrument for them to take something like this law from the 1890s, which was about making sure that black Americans had economic citizenship, and all of a sudden saying that we're going to use that law to say that you can't invest in black women and their economic mobility today, right? That's what they're doing. They are perverting the very engines of the ways in which a community was supposed to include all of us and eradicate some of the barriers that were there and using that to say somehow or another colorblindness means that anything that is trying to actually allow for us, for it to, for us to have access, for us to have control, for us to have power, that, that they're going to curtail that, right? And, and, and so this is really about, in, in so many ways, not only access, but, and, and independence, because what are we all in this room? We're, we're people who are trying to tell independent stories that are not controlled, um, that are not editorialized by, by our government, by, by people in power. That is what we're trying to do. We're trying to tell our stories in our voices. Um, but this is, this is a really an, an, an element of like, not only trying to stop that access, and independence, but also to the, the investment, the support, the resources that allow for access and independence. And so part of what I wanna, wanna, wanna also say is like, what drives me insane about where we are right now is that um, the suggestion is that if there's a woman in a room or there's a person of color in a room, that that's somehow suspect, right? What is that, what is the message that's being sent? The message being sent that the only thing that we should have is investment in white men, right? That every boardroom, every workplace, any leadership structure should be white men. And if there's anything other than that, they're calling it suspect, right? They're putting it into question. They're, we're wondering whether or not we're qualified to be there. And so why don't we stop being on the defensive Right? And I want to talk, like, spend some time talking about this. Stop being on the defensive and trying to prove up what we know to be true, which is that when we're around, things are better in every way. Right? Why do we stop? And so let's get off of the defensive and stop letting them suggest that them in a room by themselves has led anywhere good, because look at where we are right now. We are in a country that is more divided, that is more a place that people are more pressed, that they are economically not in a place that we need to be than we have been in decades, right? That's where we are. And the project is one to continue to divide us. And so um, 
all white spaces are not good spaces. You know, all male spaces, not good spaces. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's the project that we are, we are trying to deal with, right? And, um, and, and I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about the way that the legal piece of this has come, but I want to I wanna be really clear about a couple things, right? The law has not come for us yet, right? The law has not come from the ways in which all of you are creating spaces and investing in each other and funding each other and telling your stories. They want you to believe otherwise, right? Because the way in which they work is through fear. I've been on the other side of them for the last 20 years of my life, right? They will send the same letter, a form letter, to every school district in this country saying, hey, your mentorship program for Native American kids or for black kids, you need to get rid of it. It's the same form letter. They haven't looked at how it operates. They haven't looked at how it works. They don't, they don't look at what it is that it's trying to benefit. It's just the same letter, right? And we're all scurrying away in fear. So what I want us to figure out together, collectively, right, is how do we get out of a place of defensiveness, out of fear, and into a place where we understand that the way in which we do it, we're doing things is benefiting not everyone in this room, but all of us. And it is building something quite different. Uh, we wanted to turn the mic to you all now. Um, first of all, how many folks in this room uh, represent or lead uh, an organization that is in Color Congress? All right. All right. These are the people, everyone. And for the filmmakers in this room, we want to hear a couple things. One. Um, what, uh, if you could share out in this space the importance uh, for you and your career of having organizations that have really been a a attentive to your unique identity and experience, what that's meant for you, what it would mean for you to not be able to get that kind of support or for the people who are coming up behind you to not be able to get that kind of support. We also want to hear, you know, on Arima's invitation was like, we, we want to get mobilized, we want to kind of um, start, uh, not be afraid and, and and start uh, using our voices in various ways. Do you have ideas? This is a room full of super smart people. Do you have ideas that you want to kind of put out there of, uh, of ways that uh, you'd like to see um, our voices be used and, and, and heard? Um, that's, that's sort of what I'm throwing out to you all right now. Who wants to go? Yeah, Don't yeah. be yeah, shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Too loud. Yeah, it's okay, great. Perfect, it's great. Perfect. I'm not a filmmaker, but I do work in a nonprofit um, that produces media content, radio shows, television, um, and we develop programming to really champion behavior change and address harmful social norms. On the topic of funding and kind of intersecting with Anna Maria said, we're in this weird space now where we're, we're spending a lot more time trying to trying to appease funders who say, you can't say this, you can't say that, you can't, you, you can't be too inclusive, you can't talk about abortion, you can't talk, et cetera. So a uh, question is, what are some more non-traditional non funding streams that you all have seen be successful or maybe are emerging that we could more lean into? Does anybody else in the room have an answer to that question? I mean, I can, I can start the conversation, I can start, jumpstart. We, we had a conversation about this just this week with our membership, and I think the moment that we're in is taking us to the edges of what a 501c3 status can do for us, and taking us to the edges of what philanthropy can do for us. Um, and I think what, I just like we're taking us to the edges of what electoral, policy work can do for us in organizing, right? And I think what, we're, what, what I'm seeing is that the C3 status is a benefit and is getting people paid in ways that they wouldn't normally have been paid. Um, and philanthropy is stepping in to support some cultural and creative work. Um, and all of that comes with strings. And right now the strings are looking like ropes. <laughs> if you talk about Gaza, 
if you talk about, um, you know, if you talk specifically about Trump, if you talk about, and then the list goes on. And, and the fear that Anarima is speaking about um, that is, you know, coming from the specter of the fearless fund, which may in the future make it uh, illegal to have race-based grant making and um, funding, that fear is starting to s close philanthropy down. Just the specter of it is closing, it, or is being used as an excuse to like, well, maybe, maybe we, we should pull back from this funding. So I think what, we're, what, 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 what this clarifying moment is for doing for me is reminding me that uh, of the limits and the boundaries of what these institutions and structures are, where they're beneficial and where they are harmful, and how we have to maneuver around them. So that question about um, how do we resource this work with, uh, outside of philanthropy, I think there's what I get excited about is not just a Kickstarter, because, I mean, a Kickstarter is going to kick your butt to do, right? But, but the idea about resourcing this work from community is not a new idea, right? I think we pulled ourselves away from it when philanthropy stepped in. And I think we're seeing that philanthropy is coming with strings and we, and we have to divert, when we think about diversifying, it's not just like, let's sell some things on the side, let's engage our members and our community in a different way. So I think there's other, there's other models that have been around that we have to remember and go back to is one offering I would add to the conversation, but I hope others have ideas. Yeah, I just wanna throw out the idea uh, for one thing, for SIF Media 215, um, I would like to see us generate half of our income through services and through content distribution and not rely 100% on ph philanthropy like we have been. Uh, philanthropy has been our startup capital and we have raised over $860,000 over the past four years to have a staff, <laughs> to have an office and equipment. I think one thing, if you take a page out of Philadelphia's history, you look at the Sullivan Principles and you look at Leon Sullivan and his OIC program. And then you also look at his 360 program where they built the first inner city mall in America in North Philadelphia, uh, where I grew up. I'm from Nicetown, Toyoga. Shout out to Nicetown. And members like my grandmother gave $10 a month for 36 months to fund the first urban mall, shopping mall. So we have the power collectively if we work together. I've always believed that if African diaspora people and uh, Latinx people and Asian people of the diaspora linked together in America alone, we could rule Hollywood because we have the audience for our work. I know Good Grief, which was spearheaded by the wonderful poet Ursula Rucker, based in Philadelphia, her workshop created 18 poems, 18 poets, and eight amazing films, which an audience like you, I know, would love to see. So we have to go around the gatekeepers directly to you. You know, it's hard for me to answer that question because I feel like a lot of the models will come up just as a reflection of capitalism. And, and, and it sounds like a question on the grant application, you know, what we should do once we give you money afterwards to sustain yourself. Um, but I just want to echo the community, right? And, and we, we have from a BIPOC community, uh, a cultural exchange of currency, that's not just money of relationships and how do we come in for each other in different times, right? And, and whether you pull monies or different things based on those. And, and um, you know, as, as was said earlier, kind of I think that's within the structure of philanthropy that's becoming ropes. You know, I have a funder that's willing to give us money, but we have to focus on Asian American and entertainment. What does that mean, right? And, and, and in terms of having to balance these things. But as a, as a nonprofit, I still have to figure out how to pay staff. and. and and, and, you know, um, I just sort of want to, the, 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 the word of fear that's been put up here, right? It's always a fear. We're always afraid because we're always fighting for our existence, right? Not, you know, for our last couple of years, it was like we're just fighting for progress. We get to, you know, go come here. So enjoy this festival, not just for the truth of, of our stories, but 
for our dreams and nightmares that, that's being presented on the screen. And, and so did this time that's sort of fearful is because we have just fight for basic existence by just living. And that, that sort of hopefully gives a little bit of, of, of energy to, to sort of the, the collectivism that's trying to happen here. But um, yeah, I, I think if, if, we, if we're able to give you the answers, I feel like we solved capitalism in a way or kind of all these different things and how to do that. But I just want to, sh I think one key word, I was always told the water is not a resource, but as a source. And how is the community resource the water and not take yes. away from it, right? And then, and, and how do we, that, that sort of values has sort of been just what's been permeating here. And, and, and that's been, been great to be part of. Just want to quickly offer kind of a, a blend of the two. It's the power of community and also the, the fact that we got to look at ourselves and really assert ourselves and celebrate and lift each other and our talent. But Nadine talked at the beginning of the conversation, she mentioned the uncomfortable conversations. Those not only happen with funders, those also, those also need to happen with community, right? With ourselves. And, um, you know, now there's this tension with, with nonprofits. I will say, I know that you mentioned when you were talking about the report, the number of projects that are fiscally sponsored. FLAF is fiscally sponsored. That's a decision because we want to be part of a community of arts and culture and heritage projects and understand that the importance of solidarity, the importance of sharing resources, the importance of learning from each other. And the participatory practices is where it's at. It's where it's at. Once you start telling the funder, no, we're gonna we're gonna find another way, right? There are ways to innovate and and really celebrate what we have to offer. I, I don't have great contributions to the moment of of how we do this differently, other than what's already been shared, which is, uh, you know, in some ways. Um, Let's honor how we've, our, our, our ancestry and our traditions in a different way, which is, you know, a, a friend of mine told me the other day, we were talking about um, him growing up in poverty and, and how in his family in Morocco, like they would, they would feed um, anyone who was coming in, even though they didn't have enough food for themselves. And he looked at me and he said, you know, we share what we don't have, right? And um, I just think, I've been thinking about that so much, which is, you know, the, the ways in which not only is, is, is divide and conquer coming from all these forces in America today, but it's coming from the very ways in which we fund and distribute, right? Which is, like, it, it just reinforces the idea that we are, like, pitted against each other. And there, there's ways in which, like, in these, in these spaces, in this place, you know, Black Star has been a place of such joy, right? And doing things in a different kind of way. So I hope that we can actually tap into that and, and, and realize that we're also doing it to ourselves, right? And, and it's because we're in a space of scarcity. So, right, like part of this is how do we get out of this feeling of scarcity all the time and in a space of what is it, like, like we are worthy, right? We are worthy and we are rich in so many ways and what are the ways in which we can tap into that in terms of how we, how we end up moving forward? Um, look, it's, 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 it's a really tough time, right? Like even, I'll just give the, the example of the black entrepreneurs, the, the money going into black women entrepreneurs went down 70% in one year at the moment that this case was coming up and you're like, like it's already, it's already like, it's already shrinking, right? And so, and then you gotta, you gotta deal with someone telling you um, you're not worthy to invest in, right? Um, so, so I understand the context we're in, but there's, there's ways in which our language, the way we see each other, and the way that we engage with one another um, can mirror something quite, you know, quite different than what we are getting from the world. Thank you for all those really great contributions. I also want to add that uh, we have a lot to learn from our Native siblings who have been leading the charge, um, and uh, we should be collaborating with them as well. Um, any other comments or uh, contributions to, to the um, conversation we've been having? Yeah. In the back corner over there. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for all the work that you've done. I do always read your reports and it's super inspiring. Uh, the group I really want to shout out is Brown Girls Doc Mafia. 
Uh, they have helped me so much, and I think so many other folks. I mean, for the last five years, they've offered some tangible help to me on my film, whether that's connecting me with other great creatives that are a core part of my team now, um, or offering us pitch sessions with major networks, um, and also just taking our ideas and bringing us together. And um, yeah, they've done so much, I can't say enough good things about them. Uh, as far as suggestions, um, I mean, I think one place that we can build, which is what um, I've tried to do with my film to kind of circumvent the film grants I'm not getting, is um, community organizations. And I think that because uh, so many of us are always screening our films in different stages for the community, that's something that you know we can actually talk about more and try to get them to come along to. Um, understanding storytelling as benefiting their organizations or like certain movements since we do often have so many intersections between our work and political themes and uh, community work. Um, the, the only other thing that um, I want to say too is I, I mean, I don't want to say like we just we should give up on funders entirely. I don't think that they're going to make changes anytime soon, film funders, but um, one idea that I'd like to offer is um, I would love to see film funders complete the core application and post it to their website because I want to know how are you helping us make our films more accessible? What steps are you taking? Do you think you're going to offer a caption grant? What steps are you taking to care for your community? Because here's what I'm doing with my body and my time and my money. So, like, how are you going to connect each other? What steps are you taking to offer feedback to someone in the future? How are you lifting up finalists that have made it to the 1% but didn't get money from your fund? And I think that by introducing that transparency, they might not change, but we can have other levers to push for the things that we want to do. Okay. All right. See what happens when we lean on community and the brilliance that's in the room already? <laughs> Anyone else? We have time for one more question. In that back corner over there? Oh, back up, because I have a mask on. Um, I'm Charlotte. Uh, I'm a part of a nonprofit called One Kilo Strong. We essentially focus for black women in rural areas. We kind of give electoral education and cider resources. Um, so I'm a little bit younger. I'm only 22. Um, I am freshly out of, I would say, college. I graduated from the first degree granting HBC of the nation, the Elite University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm not a creative, but um, going through my undergraduate degree, I see the lack and need for creatives who are younger. Um, in my generation, we understand the need for things like this, for panels like this, for films like these, for us to have a voice in a space, for us to kind of, I would say, bring awareness to the values and the problems that we need and the solutions that we need to offer. So as you guys are in the field, and I appreciate all the work you guys have done, I can't wait to see more. Do you have any kind of advice for people who want to do these things, especially at my age? Great question. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I, I'll just, I'll just, I'll jump in. Let, let me just say, like, there, there is a way in which, when we've seen on college campuses, what we have seen in movements, what we've seen in the ways in which stories are being told, that your, the 22-year-olds are showing us the way, right? And so, and unfortunately, right, what's happening? We're targeting, gaslighting, and arresting instead of, instead of, you know, instead of actually learning and trying to understand what's the ways in which we can build community in different ways. So what I would say is, is like, I, I, the ways in which we can uplift and support and invest in how it is that you're doing what we're really struggling to do in terms of building communities of dignity, you know, of justice, of worthiness, <laughs> like, like that's 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 the part that I think is 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 critical and essential right now, and um, sadly heartbreaking that we're just not doing it. So uh, we have to. We, we I want to circle us back up to close, and I think um, what 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 words kind of resonate for me from this conversation. Um, I mean, you know, we kind of say we got us, but, but, but if you really think about kind of the wisdom that I, I was hearing from this panel, 
It's that when we, when we turn to each other and not against one another in this moment, when all of the forces, both political and economic, and our muscle memory says, protect yourself and protect your own, um, the, 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 the positionality to push yourself through that and to turn towards your kin, whether your kin look like you or not, um, whether your kin come from the same nation space, gender space, all of that, um, and to think about not only turning towards one another in this moment of it really existential crises. I mean, not to end it on that note, but we are facing existential threats right now. And the fear is here for a lot of us, right? It's here when we walk on the street, it's here on our social media feed, it's, we hear the fear in our families. Um, and we see it in the industry as the industry is turning you know, in on itself. And so that fear impulse tells us to protect, right? And it's counterintuitive to open our hearts in that moment and open and turn towards one another. But when we turn towards one another, such beauty and power can happen and then we see ourselves. We see not only the power that we have, the ancestral knowledge that we carry, uh, but also the resources and the sources of wealth in all the ways that we define wealth that exist within our communities. And we see our power to challenge, as this said, the in, uh, uh, as, as you said out there, the in, the, challenge the systems that are asking us to stay in a box. So um, that is kind of the energy that I'm um, being buoyed from today, from this conversation. And I, even though we're gonna have to close this conversation now officially with the camera, we can stay in the room as long as we, for a lot longer. So we would love to keep um, I, generating ideas and solutions with this really powerful group of folks who are in the room with us today. So, but first I wanna thank our panelists for their brilliance. I want to thank Black Star Programming and Tech Team for their support. And I want to thank all of you for bringing your hearts and minds to this conversation.